this working? Cool. There we go. Now it's working. Um, right. I'm Keegan. Uh, hello. Uh, I work at a place called Sourcegraph. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a thing called monitoring as code. It's kind of a riff on the whole infrastructure as code. Um, yeah, so a bit of an introduction. Um, this talk is about treating this, your monitoring as just code. So i.e. the rules and alerts that you create in different systems that can wake you up at night, that sets off pager duty or ops genie or something like that. Um, and the idea of treating it as code is that when it's code, we can apply all the useful DevOps principles that we've learned to it. Um, I'm, in particular, I'm going to talk about Prometheus and Pingdom. Um, this, I, I, but I believe the principles and the things that I'm saying can probably apply across to other, other tools that exist. Um, yeah, so some background about why I care about this. Um, we've, we've kind of been doing monitoring as code internally at my company um, since, since the beginning. Um, but it ended up turning out to be quite a nice, uh, quite a useful thing for us. Um, so the, the product that we make is a developer tool. Essentially, it's like uh, code search and intelli uh, code intelligence. But because it's a developer tool and it's working on code, we actually ship it to people's data centers. So a large company will deploy it inside their data center and it'll provide all the features to their, their developers internally. Um, but because of that, it's looked after by a developer tools team, usually, and they're the ones that are, um, if it stops working, they're the ones that get the blame, not us. Um, I mean, we'll get it a little bit later, but <laughs> they, they're the ones that want to know when it goes down. So they care about monitoring as well. Um, and the way we ship um, our product is either a single Docker image or a bunch of Kubernetes resources, and they apply it in their own data centers. But with those Kubernetes resources, we actually ship our monitoring rules as well. Um, and so what actually happens in practice is uh, these teams will fork our repos um, with all the Kubernetes resources, and then they can actually change the monitoring rules to suit their own needs, add more rules to it. Um, and then on top of that, they can also track our upstream. So as we release new versions, they can merge in and any changes we made to monitoring rules, they can then resolve conflicts uh, and integrate into the, their own deployments. Um, yeah, so there's already been a talk on Prometheus, so I'm not going to spend too much time on Prometheus uh, or explaining what it is, but I, I will give a little bit of an example of it just so I've got something to talk about. Um, uh, this Prometheus instrument code, so you take a service that you have generally, norm you normally do it this way, and you change it to increment, uh, increment some st statistics or observe some statistics. Uh, in this example, I've got a little counter called my failures total, um, and we just increment it whenever there's a failure, more than likely. Um, and But they can also have labels. So for example, um, there's a, at the bottom there, there's an example called GitHub request total. So this would, for example, be a metric around interacting with the GitHub API. You could give it labels saying, oh, I'm interacting with the repos API, and I got a response code of 403. And these uh, labels can then be used um, in your alerts as well. So that's why it's interesting to know about the, the labels. And then what are um, alerts in Prometheus? Well, Prometheus kind of makes it much easier to treat it as code because it is code. I mean, at least at a DevOps conference, you can call YAML code. Um, so yeah, it's just you take the expressions that you create your graphs with. Um, and if those expressions evaluate to something, like true, um, the alert is firing. Uh, you give it a name, so if that top one is too many failures, essentially what that expression is saying is that, that my failure total thing that I mentioned on the last slide, if it's uh, gone up by more than five in the last f uh, minutes, let's fire this alert. Um, the interesting thing to note about alerts is it is just plain YAML. Um, and you can assign labels and annotations. So annotations are kind of like uh, data that's included with the alert when it fires, while labels is more like metadata about the alert. So you can use it to root your alert, so you can go to a specific team. So for example, the second alert here is something that we actually use. I copied it from our own code base. Um, it's a very generic alert that works across pretty much all our services. All our services are running Go. All our Prometheus, uh, all the, the Prometheus exporter for Go, We'll always have a thing which watches the Go routines, which is basically like a thread count. Um, and we have an alert that just says, hey, you've got more than 10,000 Go routines. That's a lot. Um, and it's been like that for more than 10 minutes. There's probably a leak somewhere. So this, is, this just applies for all our services. And it gets routed to our core team um, to, take, uh, to investigate it. Yeah. So 
once it's code, what you get out of it is you get source control. And the great thing about source control in this context is that you've got a timeline of how things have changed, you've got who changed it, and you've got a reason for why it's changed. Um, and if you have experience with a lot of other monitoring systems where, oh, I just went in SSH into this machine and changed it, and you have no idea what happened. So th it, this is like the same thing about whole infrastructure as code. With monitoring as code, you get all those same benefits around auditability, et cetera. Um, and because it's in source control, ah, no, before I get onto that, let me also talk about its code, so you can unit test it, which I think is a bit bonkers. Um, <laughs> you can take alerts and write unit tests for them. So Prometheus supports this. Um, it's also just a YAML file. Uh, I, I won't get too much detail about how unit testing works in Prometheus, um, but I will give like a snippet of an example just to give you an idea of the flavor. You essentially generate uh, monitoring time series data, and then you write assertions against it, like is this alert firing, or does this expression evaluate to a certain value? Um, it's actually really useful um, for when you're creating alerts, because when you're creating alerts, it's very hard to know does, how does this alert actually behave, because normally you don't want the alert to actually be going off, because that actually means something's wrong. Um, so you can simulate a bad condition uh, just on the, the metric side, and assert that it works, and you get out things like what will the description actually be, what labels exist for it, um, yeah. Right, so once you've got unit testing, you've got source control, the next obvious step is that people are going to not run their unit tests. Um, so you add continuous integration. Um, so when people push, you have your CI system like Travis or uh, Buildkite or something along those lines, and it runs a script against your alert files. Um, this, I mean, it's not too important, the details in this slide, essentially it's more of a talking point. So like you can check, there's a whole bunch of different YAML files that Prometheus uses, there's your config, there's your alerts, there's your rules, um, and there's a tool that Prometheus ships with called PromTool, um, and it will go and just basically, it's like a linter, it checks if the YAML's correct, the scheme is correct, and other things. And you also use PromTool to run your unit tests. But I think the really, really cool thing um, outside of this, um, these like kind of basic examples, just running unit tests, checking if the scheme is right, is that normally with monitoring and alerting, there's a bunch of like team conventions or, um, yeah, team conventions, like you want to create your own linting thing. So like we have a convention, or a rule rather, that every alert needs to have an assignee. Um, and the fun thing about it just being YAML, and yeah, saying fun and YAML in the same sentence, um, is that you can write, quite easily use existing tools to inspect YAML. So that bottom thing, if you can read it, is just a quick uh, JQ expression. So JQ is a, a query language for JSON. Um, then we use YQ, which just literally just translates YAML to JSON first. Um, so you can ri write a JQ expression which looks over the YAML file. So I've got a little JQ expression which looks at every single alert and it checks, is there an assignee label? If there isn't, it'll print out the alert name saying, hey, you're missing your assignee, and it'll have an, a non-zero exacode, so it'll fa fail CI. Um, and this is a very simple example, but obviously you can build in quite complex rules as you go on. Um, but yeah, that to me is like an amazing feature of having alerting, of monitoring as code. So once you've got uh, CI, you might as well do the deployments as well from your CI. Um, so in the context of, of how we do it at Sourcegraph, um, every, C, every CI run against master, we go and deploy it to our production environment. Um, so uh, we use Kubernetes, and the way we store our rule files is in a config map in Kubernetes. So we essentially just update the config map and go and deploy it out. Um, Prometheus doesn't like natively support just, oh, this config map has changed, let me use the new rules. Um, so as a little aside, if you are using Kubernetes, um, a very common, a very cool sidecar container is called config map reload. It essentially just watches a directory and if, whenever there's a change, it'll do an action. So you use this, you have your Prometheus pod and you have your Prometheus container in it and then you add this config map container and it will just go monitor the volume and whenever it's changed, it actually does um, an HTTP request against Prometheus saying, hey, reload. And then that's, that's how you can keep everything up to date. Um, 
yeah. So I've talked a bit about Prometheus, and Prometheus is kind of an easy case because they it really, everything already is just text files, and so it's quite easy to put it into source control and then do everything afterwards. But then you get a bunch of other alternatives, uh, monitoring systems, and a very common kind of monitoring system to use is something like Pingdom, which is a service. Um, so you go around, you click in the UI, and you add little alerts, hey, is my website up? Um, that's not code, though. Um, there is a way to do it using Prometheus as its own alternative called Black Box Exporter, but now you have to manage infrastructure around Black Box Exporter. exporter. You really want a, an external service to do this. Um, yeah, so using the Pingdom website is not code, um, but Pingdom has an API. And uh, when you've got an API, you can start writing tools around the API to make it code, essentially. Um, this, any, most of these services have an API, so this kind of advice will apply to nearly anything that's automatable. You can write a tool for it. And a really convenient and easy way to write a tool for monitoring um, is to use Terraform. So Terraform is supposed to be for infrastructure as code, um, but it has a plugin system. And the plugin system means that it can actually manage anything. And the, so what, what Terraform, does, I'm sure it's probably been talked about, so I'll just mention it briefly. Um, it will take, you describe a state. Um, so let me just, let me actually speak in the context of Pingdom. Uh, so there's a, a Pingdom plugin called, I mean a Terraform provider called Terraform Provider Pingdom. So you can just write a resource, you give it a name, you say I'm going to do an HTTP check against this website. Um, you run Terraform, it'll make sure that that check exists um, exists on Pingdom via the API. Um, and if you delete that resource, then Terraform will remove it. So you basically get this a state where suddenly your Pingdom checks are checked into source control, essentially. Um, and now that it's code, you can do all the other CI, CD things. Um, so what we do at, at Sourcegraph is relatively simple. So there's a whole bunch of resources about uh, how, how to do Terraform in a CI, CD sort of way. Um, we do quite a simple way because we don't actually change our Pingdom checks very often, so we can use a very dumb approach and avoids a lot of the pains of using this approach. Um, so whenever you run a, a, a pull request, we, we, whenever you create a pull request, our CI will just run Terraform plan. So what this does is, as a reviewer of a PR, I can go into CI and see, hmm, what is, what is this change actually doing against the infrastructure? Um, then our, our rule is that when you, uh, once your PR has been approved, run Terraform apply, commit that into the PR, and that means now that your PR is reflecting the current state of the world. Oh, so I should mention that our state file, we, for people that know Terraform, is also part of the source control. Um, so that means it's very easy to look at a commit and like check that what's described in the commit is reality. Um, so that means our, your current master directly reflects what um, the service actually has. And the way we enforce that is on CI for master commits, you just pass a flag saying detailed exit code. If Terraform plan has to do anything, it'll have a non-zero exit code. Um, but yeah, this idea of using Terraform um, to manage services that don't necessarily have uh, a way to do things in code um, is really cool because it, traditionally when you think of Terraform, you think, um, I don't know, uh, creating some AWS resources or Azure resources or something like that. Um, but it can be applied to anything with an API. Um, but yeah, that's my talk. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Keegan? <coughs> I always stand there, it's really bright. <laughs> no hands, no questions? You're really far. <laughs> I'll be there now. <laughs> sorry, where was that hand? Here we go. Uh, sorry, I just want to know, did you ever use Prometheus operator with Kubernetes? No, no, we haven't. I mean, because we've been using Prometheus for so long, like, there weren't operators, and we just never switched to them, because we're quite comfortable with how it works. Um, but yeah, no, so we haven't used it. Yeah, 
I find it impossible to change the configs on that. It's oh, really? Yeah. So maybe just go old school and oh, old school, and uh, just deploy it yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Maybe from the other side of the room. <laughs> I'm on 8,952 steps today, so I can add some more. Um, I know usually when they uh, when they recommend using uh, Terraform, they recommend not keeping the state file and version yeah. control. So um, has that actually worked out in terms of like not having issues due to merge conflicts or weird stuff happening with the state file or the state file getting out of sync with the reality, or has it pretty much worked out okay? Yeah, because what has your experience with that been like? Yeah, because I mean it, it does give issues, right? But because we change it so infrequently, it's not like we're doing every deploy. We now have to update some like variable in our Terraform state in this particular example of managing monitoring code. Um, it hasn't been an issue. What we do do to work around things like that Terraform version number changing and having stupid conflicts around that is that we have a little wrapper script for Terraform so you're running the same version as what the state file is at. And you can like override it. That means our CI and every developer is running exactly the same version of Terraform. And I find that's where most of those issues come from. And because we, uh, enforce that master reflects reality, it ends up being that the only time you can get a conflict is if you're not based off the latest master. And we don't have weird race conditions because we update it, we don't like update it every day. Yeah. But yeah, that they do recommend not doing it, but because of our simple use case, and I think for a lot of people in this sort of use case, you can just do the simple thing. Any more questions? Shall we take one more? No, great. Thank you, Kian. Right, cool, thanks.